Lawrence, Susan Bernard joins us now on the morning show. You're very welcome to the programme. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for um, having me here. We're thrilled to have you here. Uh, we'll find out why you're in Ireland in, in just a little while. But um, Marilyn, you say, never forgot your dad for the start that he gave her. Absolutely not. Um, when he shot her on the set of The Seven Year Itch in New York, uh, she saw him in the crowd and she ran up to him and she stopped everything in front of the entire crew and she said, and she hugged him and she said, remember Bernie, everything started with you. And she wrote it down for him actually. Yeah. That's fantastic. And that's actually in the book. Uh, there there is book. the which is the book we're going to talk about. The in book we're going to talk about, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the photos are particular, that photo is particularly, particularly relevant at the moment because the dress that Marilyn Monroe wore in it um, just sold on Saturday for $4.6 million. Yes, isn't that wonderful? Isn't it amazing? It was owned by the actress Debbie Reynolds, Debbie was Reynolds, it? Yeah. yeah. So the photo itself. Good for her. I'm sure the photo <laughs> itself probably must be worth a pretty penny as well. You obviously own all the originals I own, still. I own the copyrights and the negative. And actually, for the first time, you'll see the actual ne negative of that image was actually photographed. And you'll actually see the br brackets, the negative brackets. So you see the entirety of vintage of what it is mm -hmm. in a book. The book's coming out in the autumn in the States and, and uh, as, as we mentioned, lots of unseen photos of Marilyn Monroe, but also uh, the end of the book is all about her passing uh, and speculation as to what happened from your father's notes, um, from his friendship and also your ideas on all these conspiracy theories that have surrounded her death. Right. I did a lot of research at the time. Um, I was compiling this book. I went through all of my father's suitcases and it took like six months just to read it and sort of try to distinguish his handwriting because it was that old European German English <laughs> written right. handwriting and to put what should be in the book and what shouldn't be in the book and ultimately during in 87 towards the end of his life when he was battling cancer he was obsessed with trying to find the truth of her passing and what really happened and his mission his literal mission uh, was to, was to dispel the theories that he knew were invented just mm -hmm. for speculation, all the conspiracies. And uh, he had gotten a letter uh, from a John Bates Sr., who was uh, Bobby Kennedy's very close friend and lawyer. And uh, they, they exchanged letters back and forth, my father and him. And there were photos sent to my father, snapshots, apparently. I couldn't find the snapshots. I called John Bates Jr., since his father had passed. Mm -hmm. I tracked him down. I called him about 10 times. He finally answered. He says, Susan, how are you? I know our fathers conversed. And I told him I was doing my book, Maryland Intimate Exposures. And I knew that he wanted to honor his father's memory and what his father's mission was, as was mine. And he couldn't have been nicer. And he literally grabbed them out of his scrapbook, the original okay. print snapshots of where Bobby Kennedy was that entire weekend, hour by hour, photographs. So and I have them, these unpublished pictures, in a two-page trunk in my new book, Maryland Intimate Exposures. And it, it's like my father believed in Camelot. He believed in Kennedy. And he, he couldn't believe the theories because so many of them were lies in many other ways. And when he did his research, he obviously knew it was all untrue. And I felt it was my obligation to defend the dead. It was the Kennedys as well as my father's memory and Marilyn. Mm -hmm. um, she'll be 50 years gone next year, so your, your book is going to coincide with that yes, 50th it's a, anniversary. Yes, it's a celebration of her life. Yeah. Why do you think there's still so much magic about it? Well, there's a mythology. Mm -hmm. And the mythology, you can't put, you really could, can't put your finger on it. Because she had a sort of innocence that I think we all identified with. Mm -hmm. uh, men and women both adored her. Mm -hmm. And um, she revealed it and she was open with it. And I think that each decade she becomes bigger and bigger and more loved. And there are more books written about Marilyn than any head of state. Yeah, I know. I, but, Isn't but, that fantastic? Mm, it, it is fantastic. But the impression that, that an awful lot of us are given is that Hollywood almost took advantage of her. Not true. You don't think so? I don't believe it. I think that's the most obvious way. Oh, Hollywood, what they do to the stars, to young women. Not true. I think in many ways, considering where she came from and her tragic upbringing, mm -hmm. 
and the foster homes and the abuse and the neglect and the dreams that she wanted to become a movie star, um, Hollywood almost saved her. She was able for, even if it was a short period of time, mm -hmm. to delve into a life that she might never have had had it not been for Hollywood. I mean, she married two of the most extraordinary men, men you know, uh, playwright Arthur Miller, uh, baseball hero Joe DiMaggio, even though they were failed marriages. Imagine when they were at their best, what they must have been, and a, and a marvelous career. She had some movies that we still can see over and over, like uh, I Am Introducing, Some Like It Hot, at the Marine O'Hara Classic Film Festival this year, uh, this coming Wednesday, and um, and I'm I'm really excited about it because Some Like It Hot is one of the best American f classic f comedies, and Billy Wilder's best film, so he says, to everybody. You know, well, admit it. There was a fantastic cast, George Rath, right. Tony yeah. Curtis, it's Jack just, Lemmon. Oh, yeah, it, and it holds up every time you, yeah, get, of you see it. Does. Of course. Well, she led a very an amazing colourful life, but you yourself have led, led an amazing life, starting with uh, being a playboy. Was it centrefold at the yes. age of seventeen? Yes. 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 Um, how, how did you? How did that happen? Well, As you I, said, a young uh, Jewish virgin suddenly is the <laughs> a playboy centrefold. All true. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! What a life! Uh, no, I, w I was with my father on a. Uh, uh, in uh, Miami, I, li live in li I lived in Los Angeles, and he uh, said, come to Miami, I'm doing a whole campaign for a European swimsuit, do you want a model? Well, I was five, one and a half, so here I was in Miami, like I was spread very s across, all these towering models were above me, and we took pictures, and he said, I'm going to Chicago, I'm going to be sitting with uh, Hugh Hefner, and it, it, you know, it's a little snowing, and I know you've never seen snow, uh, would you want to come before you go back to school? And I said, oh, I want to go to Chicago. Playboy, God, I've heard about that. This is when the guys used to put it under their tables, and you'd remember just the, the first names of these yeah. girls. And I said, and you Hefner, who's you Hefner? Oh, I don't know. Oh, yeah, he's the one with the pipe. I mean, yeah. that's where my reality was. Yeah. And, um, and we were sitting within three days in Chicago at the innocent age of 17, and you Hefner was sitting at the dining room table with us at the mansion, and he said, Bruno, have you ever thought of your daughter being in Playboy, a centerfold? We would be honored. And uh, my dad sort of looked at me, and he says, well, uh, Susan, this is your decision. I will not get involved in this. This is your decision. You talk it over at home with your mother. And uh, I was sort of, you know, at the time, I was, I didn't know what to say. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it was just, I mean, their their centerfolds weren't as racy back then. Oh, and yeah, I they, I mean, they showed there, very little. Yeah, they what, did they, very what little. did they show? You were Miss December, yes, 1966. Miss December. We, we, we had it in our understanding that I would approve mm -hmm. uh, the, the final photograph, which was rare, which they never did. And that's because of the relationship my father had with uh, Hugh Hefner. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to a bookstore, an old bookstore on Hollywood Boulevard, and I went and I did all this research, and I was like sitting on the ground there, and people would see me looking through all these Playboy magazines, and I said, I can do this. I can be one of those. I could do that. Why not? And it was, it was a time of liberation for women. Mm -hmm. It was a time of the Vietnam War. Uh, it was sort of my way of saying, this is okay. I can be smart, and I can be pretty, and I could do this, and I know I've grown up with artistic you know, uh, photographs all my life of women looking beautiful and as a pinup. And I said, you know, I'm going to do it. Yeah. I'm going to do it. I'm, you know, and then I became the talk of my whole high school, you know, my high school senior. Yeah. But then after that, <laughs> you, you got into acting and you were yeah. in a cult movie. Um, yeah. Tell us about the, the fa what is it? Faster, Faster Pussy Cat Kill Kill. It's, <laughs> I, can you imagine? I even went to the film festival and some of the people who had donated their time, young students from in Ireland, at the various universities, have studied that film. And I, I'm just sort of always amazed that it's become such a classic. And, and, and when I went to a special screening of it in Hollywood, there were like people, young kids with, with, with my character tattooed on their arm. Wow. I'm amazed. I'm amazed because it was a whim that I did it. Mm -hmm. You also appeared in General Hospital. It was on General Hospital two years, and yeah, and, uh, yeah which was a, a huge American uh, television oh, success. Oh, very, yeah. yeah. And then went on to marry uh, Jason Miller, who yes. we know as the priest from The Exorcist. Yes, yeah. yes. In fact, the first time I came to Ireland was with Jason. The very first time, and I was pregnant with our son Josh, mm -hmm. and we were staying at J.P. Dunleavy's 
house, or I should say castle, and there was, it's 1974, and uh, of course I was pregnant, so I wasn't feeling very well, and there was the, tr the you know, the uprising of everything, unrest in the political and religious mm. of what was going on in Ireland at the time, and there were bombs, and I could hear the bombs when we were sleeping. I said to myself, all right, we're only staying here for three days, but one day I'm going to come back here. And it's going to be a different time and place. And now here I am, 35 years, literally 35 you years took later. Your time. Yeah. I took my time. <laughs> but here I am at the festival, yeah. and I'm talking about my new book. And I've had this hopeful life, and I have a 35 year old son. And fortunately, Jason has passed. But uh, you know, and you, you own lots of rights to amazing Marilyn Monroe photos. Yes, um, and many others too, because your father photographed yes. the great and the good. Yes, he did. He did Marino O'Hara, some gold, beautiful. Well, how can she not be beautiful? Every mm. photo of her is just extraordinary. And she's beloved, you know. Um, and Clark Gable, Ginger Rogers. There wasn't anybody. He had his own studio on Hollywood, on Sunset Boulevard. And it was he. He, he was actually he escaped Nazi Germany, mm -hmm. came here uh, penniless to America. Not here, but yeah. maybe he did. I don't know. I don't know about him ever coming to Ireland. Well, he might have stopped on the way. You maybe never. Maybe have stopped on the way. <laughs> Unlikely. And um, and he ended up uh, trademarking the name Bernard of Hollywood. So above. The studio had said, Bernard of Hollywood. Whoever thought of doing that, a signature? And it always now appears in the corner of all of his pictures, and it's an optical illusion of glamour, it signifies. And then he opened up a studio at the Riviera Hotel in Las Vegas and in Palm Springs. So he ran his own studio. He didn't work for the studios. Yeah. So therefore, knock on wood, Daddy, I own the copyright, not the studio. <laughs> well, is, we'd all love to be fantastic. in your position, Susan. It's, listen, you know, and so I've created this whole world around. Yeah, and I'm here we are, very 24, 24 yeah. years after his passing, and those pictures still mean just like the movies, just yeah. like yeah. movies, yeah. stills and movies retain, and I license and I retain and I preserve it, just like the classic film festival. Preserve the past, because if you don't preserve the past, how can you go on in the future? Okay. okay. Well, you're going to be here in Ireland until the 26th of June, Danica yes. Gareth, for this Maureen O'Hara uh, Classic Film Festival, and we thank you for coming in to join. Thank Thank you so Thanks much so for much. having me. It's been a pleasure.